Hi, so this video might be a little bit wordy because I want to introduce to you, to you a proof of concept and a demonstration of that proof of concept. Now, if you've been watching the videos, you'll have seen video 103, 4, 5 and 6 and no noticed that I've been playing around with flux switching. Now, in video 103, 6, we looked at that idea a bit further and came up with something that looked tremendously like the Flynn motor. Now, I don't think that this is operating in the same way as the Flynn motor. I mean, I think we are switching the flux, but we are certainly not using that parallel path idea. Now, in order to make this next iteration, what I did was take these, which is a microwave oven transformer, chop out the central E, chop off one of the legs lower, and then chop off one of the legs and put it together to make this C-shape. So this is a bit of C-shape lamination. On this back of the C, we've got one of the coils. We've got a coil wound on there. And then right next to the coil, we have some magnets pointing north that way and south that way. So what happens is the field actually follows the path of least reluctance going around this steel here. Now there is a little bit coming out of here, but not that much actually. That's a thin bit of steel, it won't even hold it. So there's a little bit, and here there's a little bit as well, but it's not strong. If we pass a current down this coil, what we can do is make that side north and that side south. And of course it's already got a north here, so the magnetic field has no choice but to be switched along in this direction, concentrating here at this gap. Now this gap represents a great deal of reluctance. The field is concentrated there, but it doesn't like to be. What it wants to do really is go to the lowest energy state possible, and that would be to reduce the reluctance of that gap. Now, if there happens to be a lump of steel near to that gap, of course, what's going to happen when we do that is it's going to get sucked into the gap. And that will lower the reluctance. Now, that in itself is tremendously exciting, or at least I think so. What I've got here is a star-shaped rotor that we made for the generator. So if you want to see how that's made and a bit more detail on that, have a look at 1034. And what we're going to do is hold our little C-shape next to it and then we're going to give it a bit of power. So I'll give you a close-up of that so you can see that happen. OK, let's put our seat in place, and it goes midpoint between two of the rotor arms, and we give it a blast of current, and watch that rotor. See that? That turned. OK, so, so what you saw from that side view was the rotor moved from that mid position, so this is the rest position with no current. When we turned the current on, it moved to that position and we turn the current off. And your first reaction has got to be big whoop, hasn't it? What a tiny amount of turn for all that current. But there is no attraction at the moment, everything's turned off. So let's say we put another C right there. And when we've turned this one off, we turn this one on. Now the rotor is in identical position, so it will now rotate to that point of least reluctance on the second C. We turn the second C off and the first C on, and you'll notice the arm here is ready to go there. Turn that off, this one on, it's ready to go there. So we can rotate that rotor with only two coils. Even if we put a whole bunch of coils around it, around it to improve the torque, it's still only swapping between two coils at any one time to get that rotor to turn. Now that has a significant impact. We're only having to control two coils. So the amount of electronics we need to do that is one third of what you need. Now this is not insignificant, these motor controllers cost hundreds of pounds. If we can reduce the cost of the motor controller, we can make a significant saving. There's another thing that I think as well. I think it's satisfying the reluctance at the gap here. I don't think it's operating in the same way that other switch reluctant motors operate, and certainly not the same way that the Flynn motor operates, where the reluctance has to go through the, the rotor. Here, it's all maintained within the stator. So although we've got a metal rotor here because I took it from the generator, I don't think it all needs to be metal. I think it could be a big old lump of plastic with some metal squares in there, and it would still work. That obviously is the next thing that I need to do, is to prove that it was doing that by making one. So I need another C to operate it as we were uh, just talking about, where it's midpoint, midpoint, midpoint. And I need a plastic disc with some lumps of metal in it to show that it is, in fact, the lowering of the reluctance in this gap only that's operating the motor. And I think that's what makes it unique. At least I haven't seen anything like that. And I think it's kind of cool myself. There is one other thing to notice as well. That, remember, torque is force times distance. Now, I've put this here because I took it from the uh, generator, but there's absolutely nothing to stop me having a much longer arm like that. 
So if we have a few more coils and a longer arm, we will clearly get much more torque on the rotor than if we're using a short rotor like that. So we could improve torque on this just by increasing the distance of the metal lump from the centre of the axis. OK, so yes, that is a bit rough and ready. And we've only got one coil working, so we've got a tiny bit of movement really out of it. But I think the proof of concept is there. I think what we need to do is make a few more of these C's and, like I say, make that rotor that we were talking about to show that it is not the switching the flux through the rotor in the same way the reluctance motor would work. But actually satisfying the reluctance criteria at this gap on the stator. Now, to my mind, that actually makes it a unique motor. It certainly makes it really easy to make. I mean, this is super, super simple to make without having a machine shop. Now, from what we've looked at and what, from what I've read on these kinds of motors or this kind of effect, that should have actually a reasonable amount of output. I'm certainly going to give it a go building a bigger one, and I'm certainly going to try that um, plastic state that we were just talking about. But I thought I'd share, uh, share with you at this stage because I get a lot of input from people, and I'm always glad to hear that input and always helps improve what it is that I'm doing. But I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you very much for watching.